morning, everyone. <coughs> thank you very much, Paul. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Dexter, for introducing the topic. I want to dovetail on this and, uh, and talk a little bit about shared decision making. Is this thing not right? Um, and then ultimately try to provide you with some tools and skills to, uh, to survive the so-called difficult manager or coach. Uh, not an easy task. Uh, nobody would pay me for this, so I have nothing to declare. I want to introduce the topic with a scenario. Uh, this is Dr. Eva Carnero and manager Jose Moreno, uh, who was recently, who were recently involved in a, so we say, slight disagreement, which you might have uh, heard about, and it ended up in quite a painful, uh, disastrous public uh, uh, debacle. Um, so how can we avoid this? And what can we learn from this? And ultimately, who has the say in difficult uh, clinical decision making, which is what this was about? So as uh, clinicians, when uh, faced with an ethical problem such as this, we need to go back to the ethical foundation, the foundations of medicine. And as Paul has alluded to, uh, Sackett gave us this wonderful model based on the ethical foundations of medicine where uh, the clinician can use his clinician, his uh, individual clin clinical expertise, test it against the best external medicine, uh, evidence, and then uh, uh, interpret that in terms of the patient's values and expectations. But there's a pitfall here. Um, you must remember that the patient's values and expectations must never be assumed. It cannot be you who interpret, this is this type of patient, this might be his goals, and this is what he might want out of this. Uh, the third uh, uh, foundation of, med of ethics of, of medicine uh, listed the patient autonomy must reflect in the patient values and expectations, and the patient needs to have a choice in the matter. Um, as uh, so eloquently uh, alluded to by my academic idol, Professor Albus Dumbledore. So how do we incorporate choice in this evidence-based decision-making model? Uh, it's actually very easy. If you recognize the patient autonomy principle, then the patient has the ultimate choice, and then the patient shares in the decision-making. So um, how do we get to that point? This is not so easy. Um, but why is it a good thing, and why should we go to all this trouble? First of all, you can't go wrong if it's based on medical ethics. Second of all, it's been proven to improve patient outcomes, and this is what we want, isn't it? So it's stupid not to do it then. And purely from experience, uh, it leads to your ultimate survival as a team medic. How do we deal with this in sports medicine? There's not much evidence on that, and Paul has shown us, and Paul has given us this wonderful model um, to use in return to play, remember, in elite sport, where uh, the healthcare professional is well positioned to give the objective uh, status of the health of, of, of the athlete. The coach is probably the best place to put the whole thing into context and to evaluate the, uh, the athlete's current ability to perform. And then from the informed evidence that, uh, that the patient gets, he is able to use his own feelings, fears and expectations to come to an informed decision. But this is not so easy. We're talking about return to play decision making here. Uh, there's a lot more that needs to be decided on in sports medicine, as you will know. Uh, and Paul also showed us this, that most elite athletes are at any given time not 100% fit and ready to participate. The return to play decision, and a lot of decisions around that, is a case of ongoing risk management. And the same athlete with the same injury might, in some instances, be allowed to participate, and might, in uh, some instances, be, be allowed to train, and then others not. So this is something that needs to be dealt with very carefully. And we're consistently busy with a risk-benefit calculation. And you, as team physicians out here, uh, will know that any risk-benefit calculation comes at a cost. And somebody needs to bear the brunt, and somebody needs to pay the cost eventually. So I want to um, 
maybe uh, describe the complexity of decision making in, in sport by using a generic injury uh, uh, management study such as an ankle injury uh, on an elite soccer field. What are the questions that uh, we need to ask in this case? So first of all, there the, uh, are the on-field questions. What is the immediate management of this patient of ours? Can he continue to play or must he be taken off the field? Now in this case, it's pretty obvious, this guy can't, can't, can't go on. But in most cases, it's a more gray sort of a thing and there might be people differing with your opinion. Then you get to the diagnostic issues. Do we MR scan? Who does it? And this and that. Management things, put the options on the table. Do we do surgery? Do we go conservative way? And so forth. And then eventually we get to the return to play thing, which is, uh, which is the ma massive uh, difficult question to answer. But safe to say, early on in this decision making process, the clinical factors are more important. And some say that the on-field decision making is that of the team physician or the primary team healthcare worker on the field's decision only, and nobody can interfere with that. Later on in the, in the process, the personal and the contextual factors may become more relevant. Um, now, you know that everybody wants in on this. The press, the everybody wants to have a say in how to deal with this problem because they know best. Uh, and how, we, how do we decide who are the stakeholders here? Difficult question to answer, and there's a lot written about it, especially in return to play literature. Um, but if we practice shared decision making, such as I've shown you, then the answer is right there in front of us. The best question to ask is rather, what is the patient's opinion and what is the patient regard as the most appropriate uh, stakeholder to, to assist in, 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 in reaching a decision? And then you can ask yourself, how can I assist this patient to make a better informed decision? The next question that comes to mind, as you all know, is which factors should be considered? And this is a well-known model given to us by Creighton, also on return to play, but that showed that there are medical factors to consider, but non-medical factors are also relevant. So how do we decide? Do we use this tick box for all of our patients? I would say no if we practice shared decision making. Shared decision making says we must ask what matters most to the patient and uh, what are the questions uh, the patient wants answered. So we need to individualize and we need to do that correctly. So to do that correctly, I want to share with you this very handy model uh, of shared decision making, the three talk model of Elwin that was published recently. And this has got three very distinct uh, components to it. First of all, team talk, where you establish the collaboration of a team who makes the decision, move on to option, uh, setting the options, then you give the patient and the coach and the patient's significant others uh, 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 a chance to, to look at preferences and to suss out the options and eventually guide the process into decision talk and an ultimate decision. So in a little bit more detail, in team talk, you create a safe environment for a patient and the people surrounding this patient to make the decision. Uh, and tell them that it's okay to make an uh, individual choice. Uh, just look what their reactions are, and if you see that there's uncertainty at any particular time, tell them that it's okay to not make a decision and to defer the decision until they are certain what they want to do. Slowly guide this thing into option talk, where first of all you start again with a patient. Check the current knowledge of this patient, of his coach, of the father, whoever is involved, to see what they know. And put that into perspective for them. Um, give them the evidence on it and how it really works. Discuss the real options from the evidence base, harms and benefits and so on. And then you summarize the options, write them down so that everybody is on the same page on what are the options to decide on. And then eventually, when the athlete and his uh, significant others have uh, made their preferences, then 
a certain decision can be made from all these preferences. And to cover yourself, offer a review so that everybody is on the same page. And only then do you act on the shared decision, even if it's not at all what you want to uh, do in the first place. So from all of this, how do you deal with a so-called difficult manager? In my book, I would say the same way that you would deal with any manager. And uh, you all know that uh, an opinionated uh, manager in your ears can be a painful experience. So from this experience, I've learned and I've coined some rules, some from literature and some uh, totally not. And my first rule to survive the manager is to realize that you are a small cog in a very large wheel. So leave your ego at home. Don't get drawn into the inevitable ego contest that's always there in decision making in sport. Respect the position of the team manager or the coach. And if there can be a difficult manager, in their book, I'm sure there is something like a difficult medic. Don't be that. Don't be part of the fight. Be part of the solution. This is a key rule. And if you want to be heard at all, you need to earn the trust and the respect of the athlete and the manager. Otherwise, you might as well walk away. And this is the way to do it. Make them understand that you also know the sport, that you understand how important this thing is, respect their points of reference, and it will be different from yours. Don't feed them rubbish evidence. They've Googled it. They know what's going on. Uh, Talk to them clearly in a language that they will understand about the options and maintain a professional rela relationship even if they are famous people and you're wanting to be seen with them. Now getting back to, uh, to uh, medical ethics, remember that however famous your patient is, he is still your patient. So don't talk about the case, it is a patient, then it becomes easier. If you act in the best interest of your patient, like anywhere else in medicine, it will all fall into place. Rule number four is if you are offered a job on a team, sit down with the team manager or the coach and pre-negotiate your role in this setup and your relationship with the manager. Show them that you're going to be practicing shared decision making and what is your domain, what is their domain and what is shared domain and come to an agreement. If you cannot come to an agreement, I suggest you rather walk away. Rule number five is to always check yourself to do real shared decision making. Think with your brains and not with your heart and allow them to really share the responsibility with you. Rule number six is to have a plan. Uh, and I've given you this plan of, uh, of free talk, uh, which is by far the best thing that I can uh, leave you with today. Very importantly, though, is know when it's over. If it's not a medical decision anymore and it becomes a sports decision, walk away. And lastly, my rule seven uh, to survive the manager, but my rule one, two, three, up to how many you want to in clinical medicine is listen <coughs> rather than talk and the answers will come. So in conclusion, um, Shared decision making is an art and you get better at it the more you practice it, but it's based on science and ethics. It should be a key element in most sports medicine decisions. It's a very powerful tool for you to use in a very difficult environment to, uh, to uh, make your uh, way easier. And as Paul has shown us as well, uh, it's a work in progress. It's not perfect yet. So I want to leave you with a bombshell. What if there is no such thing as a difficult manager, but only clumsy medics who don't know how to practice shared decision making? Thank you very much. <laughs>